layer to an area earlier in our visual pathway with zero bottom-up connections. But this is not what's happening in our brain. Instead, uh, our brain forms loops. So the neural activity goes through about half a dozen cortical layers before coming back to its starting point. The last uh, problem is that back propagation through time as a way of learning sequences is especially impossible. Why? Because for our brain to uh, receive streams of uh, sensory input, right, uh, without taking frequent timeouts, the brain has to keep pipelining these uh, streams of sensory input through different stages of uh, sensory processing, right? Uh, but this requires a learning procedure that can learn on the fly, which is not back propagation. It can't learn on the fly. Um, also, our perceptual system, that's one main problem. Our perceptual system uh, has to do inference and learning in real time. And it can't stop to do back propagation. Also, there's another big problem in Lily Crab et al.'s paper. Uh, feedback in brain alters neural activity. So let's walk through this. Firstly, back prop doesn't change neural activity, right? So uh, we established that we use the cost function to evaluate how well the model's predicted value is, right? And then we use back propagation, and then uh, we do stochastic gradient descent and minimize the cost function, right? So the stochastic gradient descent only adjusts the weights and biases. It doesn't change uh, neural activity. So it doesn't change the value if the neurons are. However, feedback connections work differently in the brain in the sense that the connections between our cortex actually influences the neural activity, aka the value uh, in, in the nodes. So that's why the two, the two things contradict. So that's why uh, backprop can't be used. Also, feedback connections in the brain serve a number of functional goals. So basically, uh, top-down control through feedback connections uh, has a very well-established link with game control. So uh, it's basically the enhancement or suppression of uh, neural responses. So for example, uh, attention to a particular feature in your visual field, right? So that's what feedback connections influence also. Uh, it also drives uh, it also drives activity in the cortex rather than just modulate or enable it because backprop uh, modulates or enable uh, uh, activity, neural responses. So this is where Jeffrey Hinton uh, comes in now. So during neural uh, information processing systems 2022, right, he basically proposed this forward forward algorithm because the main problem is that backprop does not model the cortex well enough. It's very inaccurate. He wants to model something more like the cortex and also pipeline, be able to pipeline data. So what is the forward forward algorithm? So you can see, right, on the left hand side over here, we have uh, feed forward feedback propagation. That's the formal name for this learning procedure that we've always been using. So we're comfortable with one forward pass in front, forward propagation, and then back propagation, right? However, the forward forward algorithm actually just has two forward passes, two forward propagation. That's how it works. But one of them is called the offline phase, formerly named by Jeffrey Hinton. Offline phase and the online phase. We'll come back to that later on. Uh, also, uh, there's a, another difference between the two is that on the left hand side, feed forward with back propagation has only one cost function. We're all comfortable with that fact. It only has one cost function and it comes at the end, evaluating how well the uh, predicted value is or, or like in regards to the actual value. Uh. But forward forward doesn't have one cost function. It has multiple. And it has a single cost function in every single layer. So for the cost function, if you're wondering what the cost function is, right? It looks like this, right? The goodness function, um, formerly uh, given by Jeffrey Hinton, is basically just the summation of the squared rectified linear neurons. So the activated neurons are basically is that C right. So that's the loss function. But basically, uh, what you have to know, right? We won't get into details because uh, it will take too long. But basically, what this cost function does, uh, the brief summary of it is that um, this goodness function gives us a goodness value for each layer, and we want the goodness value for each layer to be increased uh, for 
for during the online phase. So one of the forward passes will be called the online phase. During this phase, we want to increase the goodness uh, value of that of every single layer as much as possible, uh, so that the model can differentiate real and fake data. And then for the offline phase, which is the other forward pass, uh, it's going to decrease the uh, goodness value for every single layer, so much so that uh, the model can, like again, differentiate real from fake data. So this is the uh, two different phases. So online phase, let's get into online phase first. Huh? Okay, so it corresponds to weight. And during the online phase, we only feed in real data. We'll come back to what real and fake data is later on, but you just have to know that online phase, we only feed in real data. We don't feed in fake data. Uh, and we want to, again, maximize activation in every single layer, and it is supplied. So it can come from like a data set or whatever, right? But you do have to modify it. We'll come back to that later on again. But the offline phase, basically, it corresponds to sleep, like our sleep phase in our brain. Uh, and we feed in fake data during the offline phase. We never feed in real data, right? And then we also minimize activation, uh, which is talked about just now also. And we can get fake data by modifying real data, or we use a generative model, basically. So this is the probability function for how the model differentiates real and fake data. So you can see we minus off a threshold which is a hyperparameter from the goodness value. Then we feed it into a logistic function, which uh, outputs the probability of the data being real. But what is real or uh, real data? What is real data? So I'm sure you're comfortable with the MNIST data set. Do you know the MNIST data set? Okay, the MNIST data set is like a data set of images from zero to nine. It's all handwritten. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. zero I, to I, nine. I yeah. So this is an example of it of real data. So a normal uh, image from this data set would be just a four, right? But notice something on the top left. It is a one hot encoding label uh, of this image pasted on the top left, the first ten pixels of this image. This is real data. We basically merge both labels and features, basically whatever we want to use to train uh, uh, the model together, we merge them together. And then fake data is the same thing again, but the one hot encoding, aka the label or whatever you want to use as the label, doesn't need to be one hot encoding, it can be just a single number. Basically, that will be wrong. That's the only difference, that will be wrong. So that's called fake data. Yeah, this is the code for one hot encoding with labels on the images. Huh? First 10 pixels again. Also for the um, forward or algorithm, right? Um, so as I've talked about it before just now, uh, we know that forward propagation uh, is basically matrix multiplying the weights with the inputs. Then we add bias. That's the weighted sum of inputs. Then we feed the weighted sum of inputs into an activation function to make it uh, uh, non-linear, basically. But for forward forward, right, it's a bit different, okay? So before we do all that matrix multiplication and then giving it into an activation function, we first normalize it. Why do we want to normalize it? Because if this previous layer feeds every single uh, information into the next layer, right? basically the next layer can just look at this previous layer vector. right? This layer is a vector. We have to think of this uh, previous layer as a vector. If we feed everything into the next layer, uh, the, this next layer can just learn off the vector. You can look at the length of the vector. Again, goodness value um, is affected by basically the length of the vector. So if we feed the length of the vector in, it knows basically the goodness value already. So it can tell if it's fake or real data without learning anything. So this layer, this next layer basically just doesn't learn anything at all. So that's why we normalize it first. Then it becomes a unit vector. Then you have a length of one on the vector. So now you don't have any information. You're not feeding any information in at all. So then the, the next layer will be able to learn stuff. So the MNIS data set, let's look at the fun part now, okay? I've explained so much. Let's look at the fun part, the coding part. So this is a very simple model summary taken from TensorFlow for the MNIS data set for classifying. So this is how it performs up. 
So validation loss over training, then validation accuracy over training. 97.5% accuracy in 21.1 second. It's pretty good, pretty good performance. So let's look at forward forward. First, we put labels with images. Then we create negative data by randomly permutating the labels. So we are basically just juggling the labels around, like mixing them and then giving them to like all of the images. So it's just randomly giving uh, each image a random uh, label. Basically. So this is training the model again, goodness value, we've uh, talked about it before. Calculating loss again, we've talked about it before, makes the goodness of real data above the threshold uh, so that the model can differentiate between real and fake data. And then makes the goodness of fake data below the threshold. Again, same purpose, calculating derivatives. Predicting images is a bit different. It's a bit different from uh, normal feed forward with back propagation. Because the way that you predict images with forward forward is that let's let's look at MD's data set again. So it's handwritten uh, digits from zero to nine. So you have ten labels, right? You have ten labels, zero to nine, and basically you cycle through all of them. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. And basically what you do with each of them is you feed them into an image, the image that you want to predict. So you merge them together. You get the whole goodness value of uh, that basically that image with that label and then once you get the goodness value of all the labels along with the same image uh, you, your prediction is just the maximum the label with the maximum amount of goodness that's your prediction and then let's look at how it fares so same time 22.4 seconds not a big difference okay not a big difference train error 0 0.09 test error 0 0.09 it's not bad it's really not bad but let's look at another problem uh, set. We, we will be looking at two different problem set. Blood cell data set, basically it contains four different images, eosinophil, lymphocyte, monocyte, and neutrophil. Those are uh, white blood cells. And this is a PyTorch uh, CNN to classify them. So it's nothing too advanced or whatever, it's just a normal convolutional layers, pulling layers, dropout layers, and then feed forward layers. Um, so the loss. Oh, is this not charging? What the hell? So weird. The loss at um, okay. The loss is zero point zero five after like one thousand three hundred ninety six seconds, which is quite long now. And then this is the architecture for the forward forward algorithm. So basically, like this first one didn't work as well. That it was clearly overfitting, but this second architecture worked uh, better. But still, the train and test accuracy is not that good. You can see 54%, right? It's really not that great. However, we um, so I tested this on the Titanic data set as well, right? And you can see that it works way better. It's like 80% accuracy, 80% test. This is very good for um, something that's not using back propagation because it takes in all of the advantages from forward forward. Uh, discards all of the disadvantages from uh, the feed forward with back propagation, and it still produces quite a good accuracy on both train and test sets. So, in the spirit of open source, this is my GitHub for it and the Kaggle for it. So, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of forward forward? So, advantages include it can be used when precise details of forward computation is unknown because it doesn't have to uh, perform back propagation. Also, it can pipeline sequential data while learning. This is one of the things that we learn in the Cortex as well. And it does not need to store neural activities or stop to propagate error derivatives. But obviously, it has some disadvantages also, right? It has less generalization power. It's somewhat slower as well. Uh, and it's unlikely to replace back propagation for situations where power is not an issue. But with that being said, right, there are very specific use cases for when this can be better than feed forward with back propagation. That being model of learning in the cortex. It's a very good model of learning in the cortex. And it's a way of making that's a way of making use of very low power analog hardware without resorting to reinforcement learning. This allows us to do that out basically. Yeah. And this is my GitHub if you want to follow. Yeah, these are basically just two friends that help me along the way. 
very important. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. So, so uh, my power is so low. My battery is gonna run out. That's my battery. Right. So, uh, yeah. basically, you are saying that. Yeah. I can. I only need to run this type. I only need to run one single two four. Okay. 